Howdy folks, welcome back to Steampunk Death Auto channel. This week's review is about steampunk. It's, it's time for the steampunk. It's kind of back and forth between regular sci-fi, historical fiction or whatnot, and of course steampunk. This one's a little bit different. It's definitely different and it's something that I probably wouldn't have sampled in the old days before audiobooks. Because audiobooks have made it so easy to sample so much stuff to listen in the car and all sorts of other places. I first encountered this writer's work on the internet, of course, and I saw a picture of the cover and it was very quirky looking. It looked like some bizarre piece of modern art with, you know, a part of a statue here and, you know, umbrella stand there and all these different things thrown in together. And it turned out to be very quirky and interesting, as a matter of fact. It was called The Last Days of New Paris by China Mieville. Now that was kind of a historical fantasy. But he's also written what many people consider to be steampunk. And this, this particular series is called the New Crobazon series. And the first book of this series is Perdido Street Station. China Mieville, the author, has written some stuff that's kind of interesting, kind of strange and bizarre. And Perdido Street Station and the New, New Crobazon Trilogy is no exception. In fact, he calls his style the New Weird. Now, a lot of people consider this particular series steampunk, and so do I, by a very expansive definition. I have three categories. Category one is your usual type, you know, like the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences. It's just a modified history. Uh, part, category three, less common, but probably the most interesting, is uh, science fiction written from a Victorian perspective predicting our current age, like Michael Moorcock's Warlord of the Air. Category two is where Perdido Street fits in. It's a futuristic or fantasy world in which it has a lot of Victorian-esque characteristics to the setting. And that includes things like the technology, especially the technology. If you have steam power, it can definitely be steampunk. And the class structure with uh, rigid social classes sometimes. Um, sometimes a monarchy, often. At other times, there's the, the well-defined sex roles or the traditional mores, that sort of thing. New Crobazon is the main city on the fantasy world of Bass Lag. It's probably the largest and most dominant city. And it is a lot like Victorian London. But, in a lot of ways, it's not. For one thing, it's the center of an empire, but it's not a political empire, it's more of a commercial empire. It's a city-state. It's not like the capital of an island nation. In fact, its navy pretty much exists only to protect New Crobazon's uh, business interests, which was, in a way, what the Royal Navy did <laughs> in a lot of cases in, in real history. It's got a class structure, definitely, and it's got the 19th century technology, a lot of steam and mechanical and gears and clockwork and that good stuff. It also has magic, which they call thaumaturgy. My impression is the word is sort of a euphemism for people who are uncomfortable with magic because they think magic is satanic, but thaumaturgy might be more innocent, like alchemy, etc., etc. Now, I don't recall ever hearing about an old Crobazon, so where the name New Crobazon came from, that's a good question. But as far as new weird, it's definitely got new weird. One thing steampunk writers like to do is they take a steampunk setting and they make it more diverse. They just hate the idea that the biggest variety in the setting is between the English and the Irish and the Scottish, for example. <laughs> what Mieville introduces is non-humans, and lots of them. He's got all these crazy non-human races, and it's not just traditional things like cat people or lizard people. You know, it's not that. Those are kind of hackneyed and almost boring. No, he goes a step beyond. Probably the most traditional might be the Vojinoi, who are frog people. 
And they're one of my favorites. Cactusae. They are talking, walking cactus. Yeah, they're, they're descended from plants. And they're huge and strong and covered with needles. They, in my mind, are like saguaros. The Kepri. Kepri is a giant insect, uh, and like a beetle. And its head is a separate entity, which is kind of creepy. And I don't know how that works, and he never really explains it. Uh, and then there's the Garuda, which is a little bit more traditional, and it's fun because it's taken from Hindu mythology. It's a bird man with wings that can fly, who acts as the mount for the god Vishnu. In this case, it's an actual race of beings that all have the wings and the beaks and all that stuff. There are vampires in some of these stories, at least in book two. <laughs> and I don't remember. I would, would have thought he called them something different, but I really don't remember. I think he had a different name for them, but they were essentially vampires. And more. There's a lot more of very interesting and bizarre uh, animal and plant-like races. Now, the Mievel, the writer, he's from an interesting background as well. He's British. He's born in Norwich. Uh, but he is a Marxist. You don't hear many people who will admit that these days. And I think that definitely gets into his weird fiction. He's got a PhD in international law, and uh, he's really a political activist. He was in the Socialist Workers' Party, but he founded his own, figuring it was too stodgy, I guess. <laughs> and he's really been cr criticizing the Labor Party for not supporting labor unions. Well, duh, they don't. They support giant corporations. So he's definitely right in that sense. So, book one is Perdido Street Station, published in 2000 by Macmillan, well before the steampunk boom. And he was, so he was probably not even thinking about writing a steampunk. I believe it later was picked up by Del Rey Books. This book takes place almost entirely in New Crobazon. And the name Perdido Street Station refers to a railway station, which is an awesome name. I love the name Perdido. It's like meaning lost or damned or something like that. And the main character is a kind of mad scientist named Isaac. Isaac van Grimnebulin? <laughs> something like that. Grimnebulin? Uh, and he is kind of cast out from the scientific community because he investigates weird stuff. And he's in a relationship with a Kepri whose, I, whose name escapes me, but just the idea of human versus insect? How does that work? It just doesn't seem plausible. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's there. There is a Bruda in Yagarek. He's possibly the most interesting character. He has been condemned by his people to the, to the land. They sentenced him for murder, and they amputated his wings so he can't fly. And he's come to Isaac saying, Build me something that will let me fly again. And so that's a big part of the story. In the backdrop, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. There's an illegal drug that's going around. It's very addicting and weird and so on. It's called, pardon the language, dream shit. <laughs> and there are dissident factions that are being arrested all the time by the very authoritarian militia of, of New Crobazon. There's a plague of weird dreams that seem to be killing people. And there are also sinister machines, which I think plays very well into the steampunk genre. This book won the Arthur C. Clarke Award, which is one of the very most notable science fiction awards there is. Book two, The Scar, 2002 Delray Books. Now, this is not a sequel in the sense that it follows directly in the storyline but it takes place in the same world and it does reference events of the previous book. This won the British Fantasy Award. So again, acclaimed by the community. The main protagonist is a woman named Bellis Coldwine. I don't remember what her profession was uh, or what she did before she left, but she's leaving New Crobazon because she fears that she'll be arrested by the militia because she was friends with Isaac from the previous book. And they're blaming everybody who knew Isaac, even slightly, 
for the events that happened, all the, the uh, chaos that hit the city at the end of the book, even though obviously it wasn't his fault. She is bound for a place called Nova Esperium, which is a colony of Nucrobazon across the world. Hmm, sounds kind of like Australia, doesn't it? And so she's going to have a new life. And I don't recall that she had much of a family or any friends, so it's not that big of a deal, but she's still kind of sad to be leaving her city behind. Now, she never quite makes it to Nova Esperium because the ship is hijacked by a group of pirates. And they kill anybody who resists, but if you don't resist, they just take you captive. And what they do with the ship is very interesting. They incorporate it in their floating city, which they call Armada. I love this concept. It's very, very amazing. And all these different ships of different types from different places of different ages lash together with these catwalks and so on, connecting them. And it's, it's really, seriously, a floating city. Now, if you cooperate with them, you can be left alone and you can go anywhere you want in the city and you can have your own job and so on, find your own residence and, and you'll be fine. But if you try to leave, they'll kill you because they're afraid that you'll, they'll tell the new Krobazon Navy and then they'll come to destroy the city. So even though Bellis doesn't want to tell on them and she keeps trying to escape, she can't or isn't allowed to leave and she's pretty upset about that. The city has these two really strange, creepy leaders they call the lovers. It's a man and a woman, a couple, they're like a romantic couple, and they're into uh, physically harming each other. They're covered with scars where they've cut each other. It's, it's very bizarre and creepy. And they almost seem to have some kind of telepathy going on. And they want the city to go to this place called the Scar, which is where in ancient times this object, perhaps a comet or something, hit the world of Bastlag and produced a big hole in the world up there and supposedly it's a dimensional portal and you can find some sort of power, magical power or something up there and that's what they're looking for. And so the adventure is what they encounter on the way and all the politics in the city and all the infighting and all that and Bellis's attempts to escape. Book three, Iron Council. No, the, just Iron Council published in 2004 by Del Rey. This won the Arthur C. Clarke and Locus Awards. Locus being a former sci-fi magazine, know my website, that's very well known. And the characters are more diverse in this one, or more numerous, let's just say. Because the, most of the main characters are human. And they include Judah Lowe is one of the main ones. And he's kind of a distant, kind of a rebel. And he has been inducted into the secret society of, of uh, kind of dissidents. They have this um, magazine they call Renegade Rappin. They have to publish in secret and the militia is always trying to find them and destroy the copies and so on. They meet, but they're anonymous, so they all call each other Jack after the name of some uh, martyr to their cause from years ago. And in fact, Jack has become like they do plays of his martyrdom and so on, which are usually busted by the militia and people are get arrested and so on. Now this group, uh, and I think, I think Judah Lowe is in the group. I don't remember. There's several other characters like there's Cutter, there's Ori, and so on. And this group is going to find Iron Council, which is like a group of people who are opposing Nucrobazon, who have left Nucrobazon and gone out into the wilds. They are going by partly by this railroad that uh, Nucrobazon is building. They're building this railroad that's going to connect them to another port city, which is one of their big trading partners, and it's going to increase, you know, prosperity and all that good stuff. But in the meantime, a lot of people are against it because it's going through all these lands of other strange races, and a lot of these people are going to die um, because of the disruption. And, and you know, it's kind of like Native Americans and how the buffalo were wiped out when the railroad came through. At the same time, there's also people who oppose it just because it'll make Nucrobazon's government, their ruling class, more powerful. Oh, but another thing, and I forget this, this is one of the most fascinating things about this series of books, is that one of the major punishments in the world of Nucrobazon is not to be executed or transported 
as it was in Britain, but to be remade, which means they modify your body in some bizarre way, some bizarre, usually inconvenient and sometimes painful way. Like in one case, this woman's got a steam engine incorporated in her body and she has to eat coal instead of, instead of food. In other cases, they might put your head on backwards or they might have a, um, a arm sticking out of your, out, out of your, your side or something like that. In one case, a woman who had shaken her baby to death was punished by having the baby's hands transplanted onto her head. They were like antennae. Uh, very bizarre and macabre. So we have these revolutionaries trying to find the Iron Council and they're going to overthrow the government and they have a revolt, revolts beginning. They have a war with the neighboring city of Tesh and as usual a war means to distract the people from the actual troubles as in a lot of cases in the real world. And there's a masked figure that's that's going around. Oh yeah, his name is Toro, which is really cool. It wears a bull mask. And this guy can pop in and out like through magic or thaumaturgy and uh, he assassinates public figures. So Toro is a very fascinating character. And those are the three books. Now, I hesitate to recommend them as steampunk because they're so far off the mark, but people who are into steampunk are sometimes into strange stuff. And if you are into strange stuff, yeah, this might be your thing. I'm going to do the pros and cons now. The pros, it's extremely creative. It's very imaginative. And you almost think that this guy must have been doing like psychedelic mushrooms or something to think of all this stuff. It's just amazing. Uh, the setting, the world building, uh, it's first class. First class, definitely. His prose is very great. Some people find it a little too wordy. His big words are too much for them. Uh, you know, oh, well, I like it. I mean, it's good to have something that challenges you. They say he writes with a thesaurus. Some people say that. Well, doesn't everybody? But seriously, I think he doesn't need one. He's that smart. He really is. And some of the po prose is almost poetic the way he writes it. There's a lot of creepiness. Some people like it. I enjoy a certain amount of creepiness. It's kind of interesting and fascinating. And there's some exciting scenes. I mean, there's some, you know, there's some war and conflict and battles and danger and so on, which can really hold your attention. Now, here's the cons. The storyline really meanders, especially in the last book. I mean, it sometimes thinks Sometimes you think, when's he going to get to the point? And that's a feature I see in other books written by left-leaning authors. Uh, in particular, Samuel R. Delaney. I might have to do something about him. Uh, he was big in the 70s, 60s and 70s. So he's a pretty old man now. I actually did see him at a signing event. Got to talk to him briefly. But uh, and I love his books, but they are that way. They are very, you know convoluted. <laughs> and so I almost think it's like the uh, like it's the ideology that does it. Uh, some people don't like the creepiness and consider it to be body horror. You know, I know I know people who just can't stand that. So be advised. Some elements in the stories seem to be more part of the narrative or as Critical Drinker would say, the message, rather than being necessary to the plot. For example, the cross-species relationship uh, with Isaac in the first book. It's creepy and it seems like it seems like Mabel is saying, don't worry about the, all these all these uh, interracial relationships, it's all good, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, the last book, they have a lot of homosexuality. They have almost all the major characters seem to be bisexual. And it gets a little bit more detail than I would prefer about some of these li liaisons. <laughs> and again, I think he's saying, don't worry about this stuff. It's all natural. It's all normal, etc., etc. You know, part of the ideology. The gender stuff, thankfully, he doesn't get really into the transgender stuff. But he does go to the point where, in the third book, all the revolutionaries address each other as sister, regardless of gender, probably because they think using the word brother is sexist. Well, I suppose it's only fair. <laughs> <laughs> and it's consistent and it's not a big deal. 
Besides being very flowery and esoteric, Nieve's prose can also be very profane, and he uses a lot of profanity, and the F word appears many, many, many times, which is something that's not usually normal in steampunk. Uh, they tend to have more of Victorian sensibility, but Mieville does not, and if you don't like that, well, you shouldn't read it. Uh, there are, as I said, noted previously, the third book has more characters than I like. And in book three, in particular, some of the characters are really speechifying. They're speechifying about what their, you know, plans are for the brave new world, etc., etc. And that can be a little off-putting. Not to the point that Ayn Rand does it, for example, in Atlas Shrugged, but still, I think it detracts from the story. So, here's my ratings. Book one, Four Gears, because it's very creative and very imaginative, despite its flaws. Four gears out of five. Book two, I'm going to knock off half a gear just because it gets kind of long and I find the Bella's character to be kind of passive and I, I don't feel like she's as absorbing as Isaac was, for, for example, in the first book. So three and a half gears. Book three, sorry China, I'm going to give you a three on this one, three of five, because the politics and all the complications and the let's get to the point business and, you know, some of the excessive, <laughs> excessive uh, description of some of the sex. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll say, I'll say three, three gears out of five. So, I'm not totally into uh, rating inflation. It's just that I usually don't review books or series that I really hate. And I might have to do that sometime just to prove that I can be a real jerk at times. So, I really, really hope that somebody will, for a change, comment on these books because I really would like to have a, another perspective because it's such a bizarre series. Please also do some more suggestions. I don't see these very often, but I do very much appreciate suggestions for what I should read. Uh, please like and subscribe. That helps us get out the good steampunk word. Please also look into my books. A lot of people haven't bought them yet, <laughs> haven't read them yet, uh, and I will put the links, the Amazon links, in there. And remember, I am working on some new ones, so after several years, I think I'm finally going to have some new stuff in the list. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios amigos, from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future, and the present is extraordinary.